Welcome back. Uh, we're next going to learn from Mike Mansfield in his class entitled A Vast and Virtual Genealogical Library is Waiting for Your Exploration. I think originally we had a city directories uh, talk for you. That's actually going to be live in about two, maybe a week and a half. And I've uh, put the link to sign up for that, which is free, in your chat log, everyone. So uh, let me just briefly introduce Mike. Uh, Mike Mansfield works for MyHeritage.com as the Director of Content Operations. He holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from BYU and a master of science in library and information science from Syracuse University. Uh, please help me welcome Mike Mansfield. Hi, Mike. Hey, Jeff. It's great to be with you again. Always good to have you here. You've got a very interesting title, so I'm looking forward to what I am going to learn here today. Great. Well, thank you for that introduction. I won't repeat a lot of what Jeff said. Uh, I, I have in the past worked for Ancestry. I worked there about nine years, uh, family search for about five, and this is my sixth, almost seventh year with my heritage. So I'm trying to work for all the uh, major companies before I hang it up, but uh, we'll see when that happens. Uh, my family uh, came from primarily England and Wales and a lot of Scandinavian and then a little less from Colonial America and Germany. When I was doing my master's degree at Syracuse, I did study digital libraries as kind of a specialty, so it's a topic that I've had a long interest in and enjoy uh, learning more about, and I'm happy to share what I can with you in the time that we have together. All right, so the outline, I'm gonna talk just for a little few moments about some differences between libraries and archives. So as you're perusing these different uh, resources out on the internet, you can kind of get an idea for what to expect. We'll look at some digital library initiatives and kind of some of the history and turbulence and successes that uh, some of these initiatives have, have gone through. And in that, we'll certainly talk about some of the growth and development. Uh, I'll highlight at least one failure as an example and then lots of successes. Uh, we'll look then look at some general interest digital libraries. Uh, and then we'll shift to some geneal genealogy-specific digital libraries that are targeted just to family history and genealogy uh, users such as ourselves. And then I will spend a little bit of time talking about some MyHeritage special collections related to digital library materials and access. And I, I call these special because they have entailed a tremendous amount of work in many cases, and I'm happy to show some of those to you uh, in an abbreviated mode. Those will be uh, some of our uh, collections around a large public domain book collection, a really amazing high school yearbook collection, and I'll just give a small teaser at the end about the city directory collection, which Jeff also uh, mentioned will be speaking on March 24th. So definitely look for that uh, webinar coming up in about 10 days or so. All right, so what are the main differences between a library and an archive? You know, it seems like oftentimes they have a lot of similar types of, 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 of materials sometimes, but a library primarily focuses on collecting printed and published materials. So these are, you know, books that are produced in, in some number of copies by a publisher. Uh, that might include periodicals, uh, serials, newspapers, things that are reproduced and publish for general interest is primarily the sweet spot of what a library collection uh, staff member is gonna be working with, is, is trying to procure those published items. An archive, on the other hand, uh, contains usually primary source documents that have accumulated through the operation of some type of organization or even sometimes an individual. So an archive is often sponsored by a government agency or maybe a university or a, a church, for example, might have an archive. And the archives receives these materials in a process that the archivist called accessioning, where they're not purchasing this, this archival content, right? It's given to them by the uh, organization for whom they're providing these archival services. So the main difference with an archive is the archival records are normally unpublished and almost always unique, unlike you know the books and magazines and newspapers uh, that, a, that a library would have. So that's an important distinction as we talk about digital libraries, we're focused primarily on 
the library components, those published and purchased items that a traditional library will uh, target. So here in the United States, and it's a very common model really around the world, you, you'll have something like a national archive that's uh, sponsored by the uh, national government. And then there's often a, another uh, entity, something like a national library. Here in the United States, our national library is the Library of Congress. Another model that's becoming more and more common, and two examples come to mind from Canada, where Canada has merged both of these entities, their, their library and their archival uh, organizations into one unified uh, entity called Library and Archives Canada. Similarly, the province of Quebec there in Canada has done the same thing. They have merged both their library and their archive. And you see this also in states here in the US and in other places around the world. So sometimes you'll see a, a library and archive that's combined. They'll still have some really nice digital library materials, maybe intermixed with some digital archive materials. That's kind of a different topic. Uh, but oftentimes when we're looking at a library site, it's, it's more traditionally just the library without the archival components. All right, so a digital library, or sometimes called a digital repository or digital collection, is, is usually some type of online database of digital objects that can include text or books, uh, sometimes still images or, or pictures, right? maybe even audio recordings or, or video files or other, other formats. So objects can, objects can consist of digitized content like printed books, uh, periodicals and newspapers. And in addition to storing uh, the content, these digital libraries provide a means for users to search and retrieve the content co contained in the collection. And one of the best things about these digital library initiatives is it gives us a way to access these resources that sit hundreds, if not thousands of miles away from us. And, you know, 20 years ago, it was very uh, expensive to do really in-depth research in materials that you didn't have quick and easy access to. All right, so let's look at some general interest digital library initiatives. And throughout this talk, there are just so many examples that I, that I, that I could have selected from. I apologize that I, I can't touch on more than just a, a relatively small percentage. So what I'm hoping is that you're gonna see a, a patterns uh, that what you see here in some of these examples from the United States are also, also examples from some sites in, in Europe and Canada, is that these same patterns really exist throughout the world, whether you're in Australia, or different parts of Europe, excuse me, Europe, and other developing countries are, are doing some really nice work with developing their own initiatives. All right, so let's look at some of these uh, early digital library initiatives. So the first one that's sort of uh, important to note is the Internet Archive, and this was founded in 1996. Its stated mission, it, it's quite uh, ambitious, universal access to all knowledge. Uh, in the fall of 2007, Internet Archives began uploading public domain books from Google Books, which I'll talk about in a moment. And so my point here is there's a lot of overlap between some of these large digital library uh, initiatives. And you'll see this as you start to use these materials, that they uh, often have the exact same copies of files or they're referencing uh, each other, this type of thing. All right, so the Google Books pro project started uh, about eight years later in 2004. Uh, they started digitizing books at partner libraries uh, around the world. Technically, they also started a publisher program that was announced at the Frankfurt Book Fair in 2004 where publishers could contribute materials directly, but most of their materials came from library partners. Uh, library books were being digitized somewhat indiscriminately, right? If it, if it had paper pages and sat on a shelf, they wanted to scan it and put it online. As you can imagine, this led, well, you may have, have heard, this led uh, very quickly to some, uh, a string of, of lawsuits against Google, mostly uh, around the issues of uh, copyright infringement, of which you could claim they were uh, probably guilty uh, we could spend a whole session talking about those lawsuits and how they how they hammered out, but basically the most recent statement that I was able to find uh, just last fall in October, Google made a statement that the number of scanned books was more than 40 million. 
It does seem though that uh, Google has slowed down significantly the rate at which they are, are doing new digitization projects. So the, 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 the collection that we're able to access, and you'll see some examples in a moment, seems to be a little bit sta uh, static now, maybe growing uh, a little bit here and there. So in 2008, another important initiative called the Hathi Trust, kind of playing on this notion of elephants' long-lived memories, uh, started, and there's some interesting relationship ties here to the Google Books project, but it, this, this initiative quickly grew to over 128 research libraries in the United States, Canada, and Europe. And by 2017, Hathi Trust has comprised over 15.7 million volumes, with about 6 million of which were estimated to be in the public domain in the United States. One uh, article that I, I read recently estimated that there's probably 90% 90, 90 of the books on Hathi Trust, though, come from Google Books or Internet Archive. So again, this, this sort of large notion of, of overlap between uh, these collections. So Google Books is certainly sort of the largest uh, book, uh, digital book uh, scanning and digital library uh, that we think exists at about 40 million books with Hathi Trust and then Internet Archive following behind. So with that, I want to do some quick uh, demonstrations of some materials on these sites. And if you haven't used some of these services, maybe show you a few tips along the way. So let me jump over to a browser. So I'm just going to go to Google and, you know, I'm, I'm just got, I've just gotten so lazy that I don't even try to remember domain names. I just look them up. So let's just type Internet Archive. And sure enough, our top here, hit here is archive.org. This is its domain name. The first thing you'll notice when you come to Internet Archive is the search system for the Wayback Machine. That's a, that's a different service that they offer for archived web pages. What we're primarily interested in is, in is the second search box here, where I can search for digital books. So let's search, for example, Topsfield, Massachusetts Vital Records. And I can hit go, and I get a bunch of results back, 108 results, and I'm seeing a bunch of books. And a lot of these seem to be the same copy of the same book, maybe different photocopies of books. I can see that there's a volume two. There's a volume one in this set. Down lower, I can see that some of the books have what appear to be a color scan as opposed to a black and white scan. So often what I do when I'm evaluating uh, copies of the same book here at Internet Archive is I look at this number underneath the eyeball. I don't know if you can see me uh, highlighting this. This is an indication of how many people have looked at this resource. And generally, this is kind of a, a substitute for a voting mechanism where users are, are kind of saying, I've looked at this one more than others. So I kind of gravitate to those because generally they'll be probably a better quality version. So here's a, here's a volume one from Boston Public Library with a large number of, of views. So let's look at that one. So here when I come to the uh, book viewer, they have a really uh, fairly elegant book viewing metaphor where I can get a feel for how thick the book is here by looking at uh, sort of this relative size of the, of the pages here. I can click if I want to kind of just, you know, jump around the book. I can use the scroll uh, widget here at the bottom. I can go left and right. I can turn on different views, such as a thumbnail view, if I quickly want to scan the content more easily. So this is an example of a really cool set of books from the state of Massachusetts that were published uh, in the early 1900s of vital records, really from the beginning of the Massachusetts colony up to about the 1850s. So if you have early colonial uh, ancestors uh, in Massachusetts, these, these often called tan books, if I go back to the list here, they often uh, were published with a tan cover. And they're kind of known and known in the, in the domain sometimes as the tan uh, Massachusetts vital records. And these exist for many, many townships in Massachusetts. So there's an example of a resource on Internet Archive. Let's next go to Google Books. And I like to use the Google Advanced Book Search because this has some really useful uh, search 
capabilities. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to search for one of my ancestors. His name is Matthew W. Mansfield. But here in the title, I want to search for books where he is, where the book has a title with the word Utah in it. And at this point, I can hit search. So this should be searching for books where there's a, a set of words on a page that are this Matthew W. Mansfield with the title of the book being Utah. And I see some Supreme Court case documents. Uh, I, I do know that he was a lawyer of some sort. And so when I come down here, I see this one that I wanna show you, History of the Bench and Bar of Utah. And if I click on this, I'm brought to a, a really nice page where I, I get a, wow, a, a photograph of this person. I get information about where he was uh, born and who his parents were, uh, some information about his educational background and even his uh, party affiliation. He was a Democrat, so that's some fun material. So uh, Google Books has just a tremendous amount of, of, of books that are in the public domain. There are some big portions of their collection that are, that are not in the public domain and some of these rulings from the law suits that I mentioned restrict in some ways what you can do with uh, books like that. But old books like this, you can, you, you should be able to download this book, uh, add it to your library here at Google Books. We could talk about a number of other features that we just won't have time for right now. The next one I wanna show you is Hathi Trust. So let's search for Hathi Trust. So here we go, Hathi Trust Digital Library. Hathi Trust has a really pretty slick uh, user interface. I, I like it quite a bit. And let me show you some examples. So let's search for a New York city directory. I have city directories on my mind because I've spent the better part of probably the last two years working on them uh, a lot. So they, they resonate well with me. So here's an example of a, a bunch of results. And I think this count here, this 739,000 count is probably the number of pages. There, there's no way there's that many uh, individual books of, of, of these materials. So as I look at this content, uh, another thing that I like about Hathi Trust is I get some nice what are called search facets on the side, such as places of publication. Let's look at one book in particular, this uh, catalog record for 1848. And I see a couple things. One, they have a couple different copies. Uh, these were all from the University of Chicago. And then another thing that I think is really cool is over on the right under the similar items, I'm able to see other similar books. So maybe city directories before or after this particular uh, book. So obviously uh, one of the main things we wanna do is actually wanna look at this book. So let me come back to the uh, results page here and we'll look at full view. I think it's sort of another book uh, metaphor where I can uh, do a, a left and a right page. I can navigate through it, kind of similar to what we saw at Internet Archive. And I can see uh, these wonderful content about these individuals living here in New York City and its environs. So that was a quick, uh, very fast uh, introduction to Internet Archive, Google Books, and Hathi Trust. These are massive general interest digital library initiatives. They have books on every topic imaginable, uh, different sort of parameters and in, in how you use them, but, but certainly well worth uh, digging into. And I'll show an example a little bit later of, of how I kind of go down a, a rabbit's hole with Google Books. That'll be fun to get there. So in my experience, as I've looked uh, Beyond those big ones that I showed you, as you start to look farther afield into digital library initiatives, maybe sponsored by a university or other government agencies, you, you quickly realize that, wow, in the early or the late 1990s into the 2000s, it was the wild west in digital libraries. Everyone was kind of off doing a digital library project and it was uh, kind of a helter skelter situation. And because of that, it certainly led to situations where we have ghost towns, so to speak. We have digital libraries that feel more or less uh, abandoned. Uh, 
the good news is these are these are kind of rare, but but I do think you'll you'll find these, and I just want to point them out. The good news is most of these initiatives have grown or developed or transformed into modern day uh, services. So this is an analogy again. Uh, so this is the city of Denver. Initially, it would have been a small cowboy town, but now it's a it's a large and important city, just like these uh, city or these excuse me these digital library initiatives can become. Here's an example of a ghost town, so to speak, of a digital library initiative. This was the National Digital Library Program. And actually, this web page still exists. I just pulled this example a few days ago. They've got some great information here. It sounds quite uh, lovely, very uh, uh, well thought out. And if I click on the collections link here, this is when things get scary. I'm taking taken to a web page that is right from 1995, right? This, this looks old, it is old, these links are old, most of these links uh, don't even work anymore. So it's kind of a, a zombie or ghost town site. So just be aware that, that you're gonna find these things. Don't get discouraged. There's a lot of wonderful resources uh, in these digital libraries and I, uh, that's really the main thing that I'm trying to convince you is it's worth digging into these resources. You can find amazing things. So let's look a little bit further uh, towards today. Uh, so the digital libraries of today, here's an example, the, the World Digital Library. Uh, this was initiated and operated by the Library of Congress and UNESCO and is still operated today. My complaint with this type of initiative is it's heavily focused on what I call, or there's this French phrase, uh, object d'art, meaning uh, library materials that are almost more artistic than informational. It's, it's, it's really as if they were trying to establish this as a world uh, cultural heritage preservation site. So here's an example of what you'll find at the World Digital Library. The first thing that's kind of underwhelming here is they only have 19,000 items, right? I mean, that's pretty small. There are tiny towns and cities that some of us probably know and live in that have libraries with more than that. But what you'll see here, as from some of the pictures at the bottom, you see these very uh, sort of artistic illuminated manuscripts, very fine maps, uh, maybe rare and important photographs, the, the, this type of thing. So that's the World Digital Library. It's not a site that I usually use that much simply because it, it's more focused on these uh, almost artistic historical uh, cultural objects. But the good news is there, there's lots of other things that, uh, that we can use and have wonderful success in. Uh, first one that I'll mention is a, a project here in the United States called the Digital Public Library of America. Another similar one to this that I, I would mention would be Europeana. This is a similar type of uh, service in Europe. What, did, what uh, the DPLA is in Europeana are it's called a union catalog. So they collect records or metadata about these digital library objects, these books and maps and newspapers that other libraries around their countries or states are digitizing. And then they make a common database that allows a user to go to one site and search across more uh, materials. Uh, the DPLA has a rather hilarious uh, domain name it's very uncommon to see a .la domain name. That is actually the country code for the country of Laos. I guess they couldn't get a short enough uh, domain name that they were happy with, so they, they went with this really unusual uh, domain name that you see there. And I'll show an example in just a moment from the Digital Public Library of America. Some others that I'm going to show uh, examples here in just a moment are Canadiana. This is a, a nice initiative from uh, Canada based uh, in Ottawa, a, a really amazing and large uh, collection at the National Library of France. Uh, its acronym is BNF. And then the bottom one there is the National Library of Norway. We could spend all day and into tomorrow going over and over individual digital libraries like this. Again, my point from earlier is these things exist all over uh, the world. Your National library, your state library, local universities will have these types of resources. 
my point is I'm just trying to encourage you, go and find them, see what you can dig out of these places because it's often extremely uh, interesting and very rewarding. So let me go back to a browser here and I'll do a quick, I just gotta locate my mouse, there it is. Uh, we'll look at the Digital Public Library of America. And in this collection, I wanted, I want for this union catalog, so again, remember this is gonna search many, many uh, sub-digital library initiatives, mostly here in the United States. So this example, I wanna search for a type of a book that's often called a biographical record. Great, so here we, I get 1,110 results, biographical record, there's a bunch from Yale University. I'm getting links to another digital library at Harvard University where I could go to see that, that particular item. Uh, let me see, I think there was one down here that I wanted to show. Now let's just go to one of these here at Harvard. So if I view full uh, item, it's from Harvard, but it's actually hosted over here at Hathi Trust. So again, this notion that these digital libraries often uh, have the same materials and are copying and sharing is quite is quite common. Let's let's look for something else here at the DPLA. Again, I want to look for instead of a city directory, let's look for a county directory. So county directories were more common for the very rural parts of the country and sure enough here I get right off the top a Travis County Rural Directory and I guess this is from Travis County, Texas. And if I click here, where is it gonna take me? It's gonna take me to a digital library project at the University of North Texas. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with the University of North, Te North Texas. They have a very active digital library uh, program and here I can see this book and I can jump through the pages and I can access the information. It's, it's, a, it's a really pretty slick way to find these materials without having to necessarily think about every last little digital library initiative that you may want to check. So that's the Digital Public Library of America. Next, let's, let's look at some examples from Canadiana. When I first ran into this organization, uh, they were called the Canadian, his, something about historical microfilm. They were a microfilm uh, preservation uh, service and, and system. They've, they've sent trans, since transitioned into more of a proper digital library. And let's look here under, I see here they have a couple different search boxes. This is probably a clue to me that I can search their periodicals say se separately from their monographs or something like this. So here under their serials and periodicals, let's search for a militia list. And I get, wow, 17,000 results. Again, that's probably the number of pages and not necessarily the number of say books or, or specific items. And we can look at one of these militia lists and here, yeah, we get a book. And same type of metaphor, I get a title page and I can jump through this thing. Uh, I can often maybe search within this thing. So let's see if there's anyone named Jones in this thing. So these search widgets will often let me search uh, for specific things within a book. So here on page 113, there should be someone named Jones here. Uh, let's go back and do one other search. Again, I have all types of directories on my mind. So let's see if they have any phone books, phone directories. And wow, yeah, they have some uh, city directories from Halifax, uh, lots of other materials here as well. Great, the next one that I wanna show is the National Library of France. And there is a little bit of additional noise on the line. I'm not sure where it's coming from. So the National Library of France, uh, it's called bnf.fr. And so this is sort of our first non-English site. I am using Chrome here because Chrome has a feature that I really enjoy where it's got this built-in translation capability. And I'll often use this or disable it or turn it on based on what my needs are. I'm able to read French with some 
degree of competence. I, I, I lived in Quebec for a while and studied it in high school. I'm, I'm not super fluent, but I'm, I'm, I'm good enough to be dangerous. So let's go and click over here on the left. We're going to click on catalogs. And the main digital library initiative here at the National Library of France is called Galicia or Galisa. And let's click on this, and it's going to take me to a new sort of web page where I'm looking at all these sorts of articles about their digital library materials. And under here, under types of documents, and you can see even though I'm in English, I'm still getting kind of a mix of, of French and English. So you kind of have to sometimes, you know, decipher what's going on. And under press, uh, this one, press a, press a, a review, this is where I can find newspapers. And this top one here, these are the principal daily or regular newspapers. So let's click on that. Really what I'm trying to show you here is they have just a huge collection. I think it's somewhere around 60 million pages of newspaper pages here at the National Library of France. Uh, there's one example I want to show you from a newspaper called Le Temps. If I can find it. So I'm kind of searching or scrolling down. You can see that I get some nice metadata about each one of these titles. And eventually down here, I think I'll see one that I want. Let's do this one. Uh, La Presse. And I'm just going to search for, this is the French word for obituary. Necrology. We'll do this search and I get some hits and I'm able to then go and look at this page. Sometimes the user interfaces aren't perfectly intuitive. When I first used this, I had a little bit of struggle understanding how to zoom in on a page. And what you have to do is you have to click this button over here on the left. Then you get this control up here on the top where you can zoom in. And I don't see the hit on this first page. Maybe it's on the next page. And sure enough, here it is here on the next page. So if you have French family, uh, the National Library of France is a tremendous resource. I cannot recommend it strongly enough with the amount of content that they put on. All right, the last one that I want to show real quickly is the National Library of Norway. I have a lot of Norwegian ancestors, so this is a site that I've uh, grown to really enjoy. And I also have a hub, little, little bit of a love-hate relationship with it, and I'll, I'll tell you what that is in just a moment. So again, I'm, I'm kind of stuck on the city directories, so let's first see if they have any, what they call in Norwegian, an address book. This is sort of their version of a city directory. And I'm going to go ahead and say translate this page because it will give us a few things I want to mention. So here at the National Library of Norway, they've given me some results by books, newspapers, and if I scroll down, they have journals. And what I really think they mean here, this is a machine translation that Google Chrome has done. I think they mean some sort of serial or periodical. And sure enough, if I look down here, I see a whole bunch of address books for uh, Oslo and other places around Norway. One thing I do want to point out is the Norway National Library has really three layers of access. There are some materials that you can only see if you're physically within the library's walls in Oslo and maybe some other constituent libraries there in Norway. There's others like this one that can only be uh, accessed if your computer is, an, is on a Norwegian IP address. I'll show an example of that in just a second. So let's look at this, say, 1928 Oslo address book. I'm sure I have a, a lot of, say, fourth and fifth cousins, several times removed probably uh, in this book. Similar type of metaphor, we're going to be able to scroll through the book and see the pages. It's telling me that this is not a copyrighted book. It's in the public domain. I can kind of do whatever I want with this. That's kind of a nice statement. I can zoom in or I can search the book, uh, do all sorts of things. Let me go back and show you one other example of a book that I, I wish I had a Norwegian IP address for, and that's a 
by the book, if I'm even close to saying it right. So these Bida books are pretty famous in Norway. They're sometimes known as a farm book. And so this is the name of a village or community in the very far north of Norway where one of my Norwegian ancestral families is from. And if I search for this book here under Booker or Books, and again, I can tell Google Translate to either show me the original or try to translate. And sometimes I get a very uh, varying degrees of success and sure enough here I see a book one for this cave cave jord I'm sure I'm not saying it right uh, by the book here at the National Library of Norway this book however I cannot see the pages of because uh, my computer actually isn't in Norway so this is a, a great reason to have to make some uh, relationships with some of my Norwegian cousins that I'm able to connect on, say, through a service like MyHeritage, if I need a simple look up here, rather than trying to find a copy of this book in Norway or, you know, see if I can find one for sale somehow, I can just try to get a friend or someone in Norway to look at it from their home, in this case, if they uh, have a computer and obviously uh, will have an IP address there in Norway. All right, so we looked at a few examples. Again, we, we could do this all day. I could talk about wonderful national libraries in Australia, in Sweden, in Denmark, in Spain, all across the European continent, uh, Ireland, you name it. This pattern, repeat, pattern repeats itself over and over again. There are these amazing resources that are at these sites and services. Sometimes they're hard to find uh, just doing a straight Google search, right? You have to go to these sites and services and actually start looking. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to some sp other specific uh, resources such as the Family Search Dig Digital Library. This is a great uh, domain specific digital library focused just at family historians and genealogists. They really also focus heavily on printed family histories and genealogies, as well as all sorts of other materials. The latest statement that I was able to find as of uh, just about a year ago in April, they had 440,000 books, not only from the Family History Library, but about a dozen or more other affiliate institutions from around the US that they're working closely with. Definitely encourage you to look at the Family Search Digital Library and it's growing quite regularly as well. I'm not gonna have time to do a, a live demo there. It's a very similar pattern that you would notice from what I've shown before. Another special collection that I wanna mention uh, is this compilation of published sources that we have on MyHeritage. This is a single database. It's 447,000 public domain books, not the same. <laughs> there, there's certainly some overlap with what you'll find at Family Search, but those numbers are, are close only by coincidence, uh, 84.2 million pages. This does have a very strong genealogy and family history focus, and it is a curated collection, meaning that we examined uh, many millions of books to pick those that were of interest in our opinion to family historians. And we did that by training a curation team to look for books that contain things like names, and events and relationships, narratives, photographs. This team then helped us to select these titles, improve the metadata, and also to do some copyright analysis to make sure that we had uh, public domain content. The other thing that this team did, did is they uh, reviewed materials for sort of importance to us as gene genealogists. So something like a, on the left here, a technical manual for an espresso machine they would have probably rejected, whereas they would have kept something on the right, like this pictor pictorial and biographical record from these counties in the state of Indiana. We also did some really uh, complex te technical work to enhance our search system to deal with the way uh, these important events in our genealogists in our in our genealogy work are represented in books. All these different types of phrases around uh, births and marriages and occupation and deaths. We also did some really cool work on correcting the OCR. So a lot of these books in these public domain uh, uh, repositories 
uh, are OCR'd, and what I'm showing you here are two uh, two parts of a of, of the same list. Where on the left are is the incorrect OCR'd form of what we think to be the name William, and then showing how we were able to capture those and convert those to the correct form. How do you find this uh, this collection here in MyHeritage? You go to Matches by Source under the Discoveries tab. Uh, this is one way to find it, and one of the advantages of having a tree in MyHeritage is if your tree is on MyHeritage, you're going to get automatic record matches to this collection. So here in my case, uh, this compilation of published sources, this large digital library that we've built into MyHeritage, I got, I have 74 matches. Here's an example of one of the matches for a person in my tree on the left, this Hugh Durbar, uh, Durborough. I can review this match. I see some information about the text he's in. That's the OCR text above. Some metadata down below. This book came from the Library of Congress. It was published in 1908 in Philadelphia. I can use these controls to examine the book more specifically. Uh, look at the pages, look at the next page, look at the title page, wonderful resources. And we did much more than just a basic search like you might see or find on Google. Here's an example of what I'm talking about where uh, here's an, 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 ex an actual uh, match that I was looking at in our system where we have a user with this person named Isaac Wheeler and he has a record match to this digital library on MyHeritage in this book called A Modern History of New London County, Connecticut. And what is really cool here is not only did, do we get a hit on the match, but that there's, there's lots of other Isaac Wheelers in these, you know, almost half a million books. But when we take his name and we use this additional uh, search system technology that we built to look at birth dates, to resolve a pronoun that this is likely referring to Isaac, that he or Isaac died in this place on this date, and that he, again, resolving the pronoun, married this woman named Martha Park, which matches his record uh, really quite uh, well. And this is a wonderful book, this uh, printed genealogy where I can learn lots of possible new relationships for my family, a really cool resource. Here's an example of a particular uh, match that I got for the same ancestor that I used earlier. This drums manual of Utah talks about my ancestor, and here it says that he was involved in the cattle raising business. So this led me to want to kind of go down a rabbit hole with digital libraries to see did he ever have a mark or a cattle brand. And so let's go back to Google Books and let's do W M Mansfield in the uh, search form here, but down in the books I'm going to put in brands and I'll hit search. And sure enough, I get a book here at the top for record of marks and brands in the state of Utah. And here's my ancestor. This is my great great grandfather. He's registering a brand, uh, the date, the place he registered it, and what the brand looked like there on the left. And I guess there were so many similar types of brand that this number 15 refers to the fact that his brand was to be placed on the right rear hump or right rear uh, leg uh, of, the, of the cattle. You can go down the rabbit hole with these digital libraries. This is a really esoteric example, but one that I, 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 I want to kind of use more as an illustration than anything else. A specialized digital library that you may not have heard of is one called JSTOR. It's short for Journal Storage. This was founded in 1995, and it focuses on digitizing and providing access to back issues of academic journals. It is a subscription service, but you're able to read a limited number of articles for free, and some other content like this one I'll show you is completely free. So here at JSTOR, I can search for marks and brands, and let's put the state of Utah, and I get a couple of interesting results here. This one at the bottom tells me that there's a PDF, this was published in the Princeton University Library Chronicle. I can download this PDF, and I can read this 15-page scholarly article about these brand books, about these books that were published. And I love what the author says here at the end. Brand books are an excellent example of the kinds of materials one hopes to find in a great research library, an esoteric and little-known genre with great potential riches for a researcher. So that's really where I want to end is 
a comment like that on something as esoteric as a cattle brand book to really encourage you, use these digital libraries, use the resources that we have on MyHeritage, but also, as I, I hope I've shown, definitely go farther afield. Look at your local universities, your local public libraries. Many of these libraries have more and more uh, projects that are bringing these materials forward. And with that, I want to bring Jeff back in and see if we have any questions. Well, thanks, Mike. Brand books, I'd love it. And uh, you also reminded me of the webinar that you did about the book matching technology at MyHeritage. And, and that, that to me, that's one of the coolest technologies that, that uh, there is around. So uh, thank you, Mike. Let's, uh, let's do a door prize for the, this class, and then I've got a couple of question, uh, questions to ask of you, if my voice will hold up here. <clears throat> uh, some of you in the audience uh, are asking, when will I be able to see the recordings of the, these classes, and maybe ones that you have missed? Uh, we'll, we'll start to publish them uh, next week up at FamilyTreeWebinars.com, so just uh, look there. Uh, they will be free for a short time, and after which uh, you'll have access to any of them, more than 1,100 of them, uh, if you have a webinar membership. And I put that link there in your chat area uh, so you can click to learn about the webinar membership if you'd like to. Door prize time. Uh, we're going to do a one-year MyHeritage complete plan. And, uh, and Mike, uh, you let me know if you if, uh, need to modify anything, anything that I'm saying here, but... Uh, a complete plan includes both the premium plus family site subscription, so you can have unlimited uh, uh, space for your photos, for the size of your capacity of your tree, uh, and it also includes, uh, Mike, the, uh, the new automatic colorizing of your black and white uh, photos, and so you can store all of those there. That, that is the number one, uh, my number one favorite technology, really, of all time, uh, that that new colorizing uh, tool that MyHeritage just released, oh, two or three weeks ago. And uh, then a MyHeritage Complete Plan also uh, includes a data subscription. And, Mike, is this act, we're, we're about to 12 billion records now. Is that true? We are just shy. We're going to hit just it probably next shy. week. Okay. Yeah, we're, yeah, it rounds to 12 very, very easily. Yeah, we're 11.9. 11 11.9. So that city, that new city directories collection. Uh, just incredible. I absolutely love that, too. So uh, my heritage is doing all kinds of good things. And let's go and find who our door prize winner is this hour, one, one an hour. Uh, we're going to say congratulations to Kevin Hackett. Uh, th thanks for being here. And if I call any of your names, your names for door prizes, we're going to be giving out 24 door prizes during these 24 uh, class uh, event here. Um, so, Kevin Hackett, congratulations. And then, Mike, uh, we've got time for just a couple of questions here. And, uh, by the way, we have a live success story from Mary Beth, who says she just did a preliminary checkup at uh, Hottie Trust uh, and found a source for her revolutionary war ancestor. So, uh, she says she can't wait to dive more into that site. So, congratulations to Mary Beth, uh, we always, uh, it seems like every live webinar we do, we're, we're having these live success stories, so uh, congratulations. Um, Mike, Lisa is asking, the Internet Archives and these other sites, uh, do they digitize non-English language items as well, and are there items from uh, around the world? What have you noticed? Great question. So uh, the Internet Archive... Uh, they're a little bit more transparent in the work that they've done, say, than Google Books. But there are uh, some statistics on how many uh, books they've done in languages other than English. It, it's not as much as English, but there are some interesting numbers there, you know, German, Swedish, Spanish, uh, Dutch, French. Most of the major European languages are represented. I, I would still suggest, though, that for materials in European languages, it, you're likely going to have better success looking at those initiatives in Europe. Uh, look at the national libraries. Look at the universities. I, I could spend a whole class talking just about German universities and the books that they're publishing in digital libraries. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you. And the, the digital libraries that you showed us here, uh, Renata is wondering, are 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 uh, subscriptions required? Or are some of them free? Or just give a recap of that. 
Yeah, good, good question. Some of them, the only one that I really showed today that does have a subscription is JSTOR. Okay. Uh, it does have sort of a freemium model where you're, you're able to access most articles at a rate of a six per month. Uh, beyond that, what I've done, if I, if I really need articles at JSTOR that I, I don't uh, have access to because of that limit or another limit, is I'll just go to my local university. A lot of big, or a lot of re universities will have a subscription in their library to these materials, and there's a good chance you'll be able to access them there. Uh, that or find a good reference library and have them help you uh, access it with their account. They might be able to uh, to do that. But most of the others, all the ones that I've shown uh, here are, are open access. Now that doesn't mean that they don't have copyright or other restrictions. Like I mentioned there at the National Library of Norway, they, they're not trying to charge you, but there's certain books you can't see unless you live in Norway or maybe even physically at their library in Oslo. Okay. All right, Mike, uh, thank you for uh, your class, your expertise, and for participating in this marathon here uh, this evening or this morning or this afternoon. Uh, thanks, Mike. And uh, we will learn from you a little bit later on about researching Scandinavian ancestors. So uh, back to Mike. 13 hours. Oh, it's it's in the 13th hour, is that right? Well, no, it's 13 hours from now. So. Oh, okay. We'll, All right. We'll see some of you then. Okay, and my wife just brought me dinner, so thanks to my wife, too. Okay, uh, we'll talk to awesome. you later, Mike. Thanks. Thanks, you. Bye. Yeah. And check